Hello and welcome to the Active Atom Educational Series. Part 3, Preparing the Parts for Precision Machine Spindle Assembly. Great. Yeah, before we can start assembling the parts, you know, for a spindle rebuild, yeah. we got to ensure that all our parts are in perfect condition, you know, right? That's right. And what's the first stage? We're going to have to get, these are leaving this nice, pretty clean room, and they're going out with me, and they're going to become very, very clean and get a little uh, preliminary inspection work done. Great. Before I bring them back to you. Right, because we want to ensure all the parts are clean, especially the spindle part, because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take this over to our surface plate and using our measuring instruments, we want to be sure we have a good condition spindle with minimal run out. Because, you know, we don't know the history of used equipment. You know, uh, we don't know if it's been abused, if it's been dropped. No. So, very important, you know, we want to make sure this is in great condition. Okay, oh, the other thing is if we need... If the spindle, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, collet key, if it's damaged and we need to replace it, this is the stage we want Now's to do Now's the that. time. Yeah. Now's the time. So just a couple, you know, just maybe a couple more things we'll mention in this part. But, um, so basically, we just want to be sure the parts are in perfect condition before we move forward with the assembly procedure. Perfect. Okay. Part 3, Section 1, Cleaning All the Parts. Wow, it's finally here. Acetone. I cannot believe it. Yeah, no isopropyl for once. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I get to do real cleaning. <laughs> okay. Which is important. You know, you got to use acetone because you need that strong cleaning power. You do. Very important. There's yeah. a little more going on here than just cleaning, isn't there? Yeah, there I is. I don't really tell, I'll tell much about it, but I'm going to do it. Sure. Okay, should I share that? Yes. But yeah, they're really okay. important. Okay, yeah, you're going to see, I mean, here, this is a good example. These, these are identical spindles, by the way. Uh, yeah, this spindle over here on the left, uh, these have already been cleaned. In fact, this is a much older uh, model, a much older version. It's it the is. same, but it's older. Yeah, and this older. is much newer. Yeah. And you'll notice the finish. One of That's one thing that's going to happen when these come back to Patrick for a, before we start the assembly, uh, is they get specialized finishes, too. But there's more to just the cosmetics going on here as well. I want to give you a little details because this is choices up to you, right? That's right. You, we, we believe image is everything. So the whole the whole thing's important. And what I mean what we mean by that is so we're gonna clean these. I'm gonna inspect these. I'm, and some of it may require a dimensional inspection. And that means we're just you know, we're just gonna check it as we clean it and get into it and we're gonna Yeah. We're going to sand and file whatever's necessary, stone, I do that. That's right, make sure there's no burrs or yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, when sometimes when they're really old, we just have no choice. See, like, just to give you a quick example. Well, this is a good example where they changed the finish through the years. They did. Yeah, when they, I guess earlier, uh, they used to polish the uh, bearing caps, and then later it's more of a matte finish. Yeah, just a matte kind of off the lathe machine finish. Yeah, and see, when we restore like uh, parts and accessories and machines and all that, we always try to duplicate what the manufacturer factory did. Right. And even if it's from the same manufacturer, which but two, these are, but two different eras or years, you know, we like to stay consistent. Yeah. Yeah. So, We're, so like this is for the this is the uh, uh, grinding attachment, right? Yeah, that's the main bracket. Yeah. Okay, and this main bracket's going to get its brush finish back to its original luster. Yeah. Um, just like that, just like the spindle body is. Um, that's what we do. That's just that extra step we go. And then if there's anything, this is what's going to happen. I bring these back in. If anything's questionable, we're gonna we're gonna measure for it, and then we're gonna determine: Are we going to order parts right here? That's why we have the others disassembled already because right. they needed to go through all these processes, and you may experience this before you start assembly. <laughs> right. Okay. Is that? We're, we may have to order brand new parts from from Levin in this case from the manufacturer. Yeah. We may have to do a little rework, and we sure. may even have to machine a part or remachine a part, like a cap cover or something that's got some damages that we're not willing to live with. Right. And that's what this stage is all about, right? Yeah, that's really important too. You know, in some cases, you know, some parts have been discontinued by Levin, especially like let's take for example the open style headstock. You know, Levin hasn't made an open style headstock for many years. 
you know, all their headstocks are the closed style now. So you may not be able to purchase all the parts for the open style. And you know, sometimes you have no choice but to actually make a part. So, but those are the decisions you're gonna have to make. Well, that's up to you, yeah. You know, yeah. Just like the cosmetic finish, that's up to you as well. It's not right. required. Yeah, not required. The, the cleanliness is required. And some deburr work is probably required, suggested. Yeah. And then there's something missing here, and it's, it, it happens to be those little adorable little white rings. Oh, the felt rings, yeah. Yeah, they cannot take the ride in the acetone. Yeah, definitely they cannot. Yeah. yeah we'll explain. And, um, yeah, and what I've done is I actually put all the parts in this tray, and I've given it to Lance, and I put the felt rings aside because those actually get a different treatment that you're going to show them later here we are yeah okay it's so gonna be really neat that's great all right okay i i'm back i'm back from uh getting these parts cleaned there's a little more to it than just cleaning however i gotta give you a, a how about some time you guys want to know how much time you should have spent yeah it'd be interesting to share uh your experience going through this i've done a lot of these so it's yeah. gonna be it's unfair advantage on one portion of it and that's what tools did you need and how did you do it and all that. Well, everybody has their different cleaning methods that's why we don't we've done a lot of cleaning here you know Especially how long it took. Okay. Yeah. For me, this is the first of all, this is a rarity and it's not because it's being filmed. That's ridiculous. <laughs> this is the neatest, cleanest spindle I have ever had the luxury to do. It really is. It, it truthfully was a, is. It was a coincidence. It's new old stock. It's never been used and it's confirmed. I, I can yeah. tell you by working on this spindle right here, I know better. This thing has never seen a single job. Yeah. I mean, the spindle part, all the parts for that matter... There's nothing wrong. Everything's only only flaws I found were factory flaws. So my total elapsed time on this to share with you guys, I just came back in and changed coats, of course, <laughs> is three hours. Now I realize for you, typically this is supposed to take five hours. For me, four hours. I'm an hour faster because I have all the tools in place. I know which which acetone. I know which brush, which which file. And remember, I hand I I rework each of these parts. In fact, I reworked it so much. I had Pat go ahead and press out the main center cylinder. I want to take a close-up view. Oh, that's a good idea. Here, Pat's going to show, show off some of the sparkly parts there. Okay. Yeah, want me to mention it? Yeah, because, yeah. Okay, we mentioned to you, uh, when we were disassembling this spindle, you know, we were telling you that in the spindle housing, there's, a, there's that external uh, bearing ring spacer. Very precision. Yeah, and we told you, you don't want to, it's a press fit, and you really don't want to remove it until you've cleaned, you know, do an initial cleaning and then make a determination if it needs to be pressed out. Because you don't want to press it out just to do it. Only if it's really needed. You know, especially if there's a lot of grime or even corrosion rust. And there was this time. Yeah. But and, and not so, used. Yes. In the last scene, you saw that this was still in here. And what happened is Lance did your initial cleaning and then you didn't like what you saw. You mm -hmm. saw too much junk and grime and in between. My, and my fear there is is that it's going to make its way into the bearings, okay? I don't, right. I'm not doing it for cosmetics. All these cylinders are, are uh, polished at the when, when I'm finished, but that's right. Inside and out, but I'm, and, and this is brush finished back to factory. Right. Just so you get that. Yeah, matching the original finish. Yeah, I did that here on this milling attachment too here, right? There. Yeah, see if you notice, really pristine, really clean. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and especially, guy, we were so happy with the spindle part. I mean, it's just immaculate. It was brand new. Yeah, brand I just, new. I'm convinced. And the only reason we were having to rebuild this is it did what, what, what spindles do if you don't use them. It turned to a rock. Yeah, yeah, right. Even Those bearings aren't wore out. They're just, they're just done. That's right. Even though it looked like this has never been used, the bearings were still beyond repairable Shot. or use. Yeah, right. Cleaning everything, you're not, we don't do that kind of thing around here. Yeah. No, 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 not with this precision. You're going to have to. Yeah, and the reason why we don't recommend cleaning bearings, even in this case, is because if you put the bearings under, you know, high power microscope, for example, you'll notice that the bearings are corroded, they're pitted. You know, it's just due to AIDS and just sitting. Yeah. And and there's and you just don't want to do that. You know, if you're gonna go through all this effort, buy brand new bearings and do it correct. Hey, because I'm so excited, there was one more part. Remember that one that looks so rusty? Oh, you did do a comparison right before. See, remember that we showed it and it looked like it had rust, but it's just that brown hardened grease on there? That's right. There it's, it is. Look at it. You came out a little better than the last one. <laughs> yeah, that's what's funny is this one, guy, it looked like brand new compared to this one, but now this one actually turned out better. So the lesson here is there's four hours of work in your, in your time, maybe, I don't know, but you know, 
you have to look at it every day and ask yourself, do you want to look at something that's enjoyable to look at and looks precision? Not only just runs precision, I think it has a lot to do with good mentality. Yeah. Good work ethic. That's all. I just want to share our efforts and how we're, and then we're done for this. And I see you also uh, did the nice brush finish. I did. I go, yeah. well, let's put the factory brush finish on because I can't, I can't put the lathes the lathe lines back in it so <laughs> right i got it pretty good so even the screw the screw head everything's just perfect oh yeah i refinished that head you know though you can't just buy that screw yeah you can from Levin. i mean you can. sure but you can't it's not a it's not a part that you can get at your hardware store no no it's real, it's real specifically built for this uh for this beautiful spindle anyway i'm yeah. really proud of it oh no it looks great i'm really anxious to get this thing put together well, we're, I, if you're like us and, and, <laughs> and getting excited we're getting really excited because we get to start rebuilding this thing i, I can't wait yeah. okay that'll do it great looks good part three section two cleaning the felt rings and for any of you who happen to be watching me right now, this is uh, going to date you a little bit. Yeah, it's an old product. This could date you back as early as 1953, Patrick. Oh, is that's, that when it first came out? That's when a guy named Harvey Hewitt, who's no longer with us, invented this product. Uh, with a couple of couple of uh, scientists that he got together because he was a marketer. Oh, okay. And this was the first time a, a handheld, hand wash only detergent. This is a delicate version. They make six or five or six versions today. Uh, this product, this product was invented in 1953, and it was the first hand wash. And it was exclusively for you bet cleaning the wool. Right, and that's why you have the name Wool Light. Wool Light, <laughs> and oh, he's smart. And <laughs> and the funny thing about this is, is this is what you need actually. To, to clean and not damage your wool, your felts that are made of this fine wool. Right. Uh, your machine spindle felts. Yeah, because in our case, the felt, felt rings, rings yeah. yeah, the felt rings we use in the spindle, it's not so much about damaging the wool material itself. It's more we don't want to break up the felt because then we'll lose our nice ring. That's right. Right? Our nice form. So, and that's why we've got to be really gentle and use gentle cleaning. We do. Um, in fact, there's three things in this that are not here in this detergent, or two or three things that are not in this detergent, that that you can't just go get the fabric mach the machine wash uh, uh, detergent like, from your laundry room, for yeah, example. Yeah, don't use Tide or all. Oh, no, this is a hand wash only it, product here. It's missing several very important things that would just absolutely kill felt. Yeah, it'll break it up. It'll make it fall apart. Yeah, yeah it's gonna gonna cause things that got you know. There's there is no bleach in this product. Very important. No yeah. enzymes, both biological and natural. There are none. Um, so first, that are used in the assistance of cleaning. The others are used in this, the bleach is used for the assistance of, of brightening. Sure. Okay, so you know, guys know that. There's one other little trick to the trade here that I'm going to share with you that you'd need. So I'm trying to give you a little bit of what they're going to need to start this cleaning. Sure. Because I know that you just spent five hours cleaning the <laughs> spindle, okay? And, and you think you're done. But you almost are. You almost are, Then yeah. we're going to get into assembly. Come on. It, it's getting exciting, and this is a, yeah. like, a little reward. You, you do not want to use these faucet hard water in your home. You're going to need a... Right. We're going to use distilled water. Right. I've eliminated the problem, but you just definitely need soft water here because there's a lot of... Uh, minerals and uh, metals in in uh, oh sure and and again chlorines and stuff i don't want that right felt affected it's not for today it may but patrick why don't you give a good ex I, I think you want to share all the oh yeah felt yeah this is interesting let's take it a look at these okay what we're seeing here is we have three sets of spindle felt rings and these, these three sets are actually all for 11 accessory spindles. So we're actually rebuilding three little spindles. Of the same, of yeah. This, yeah, so that's pretty good. And the reason why I want to uh, point these out is I kind of wanted to share with you a couple of things like Levin's choice of grades and, and things like that. And uh, really important is the type of felt rings that we're seeing here are 100% wool-based felt because there are synthetic felts there is synthetic felts and, and these are very very nice wool based uh very high quality actually wool right okay and um before we continue with that though let's share um some felts from a company we use and this is actually from buffalo felt products corporation and before anyone starts thinking with well, the Smithsonian institute and we just happen to have this <laughs> book on on felt around here the, there's a reason for it that's here because uh we're doing a spindle right now that is is i think it's a, 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 a 
40 taper spindle. 30 taper. It's a 30? Yeah. A BT30? Yeah, BT30. Yeah, it's a BT30, and it requires a custom-built felt ring that's no longer made right. at, the, at the spindle nose to protect it. And we are m making that here, and we had to make a selection on which felt was going to be best, and that's why it's here. Yeah, and so here's... So this is just one company, and what you're seeing right here... Let's see if I get in the camera. Okay, what you're seeing here are the different grades uh, they make, common grades. And uh, what this is showing is it's showing the hardest grade all the way to the softest grade at the bottom. And see, as you can see, so there's different grades, and these are 100% wool based. Yeah. And as you, as you notice too, uh, depending on the grade, they're also different colors. See, mm -hmm. white, um, really dark, uh, more gray. And, and what's really interesting is there are different uses and applications for each grade. Like this, some uh, manufacturers pretty good. You know, they have a little chart for recommended uses, and see, they show the different grades and what they they give examples of like uh, what their usage is and you know for machine use. Because isn't this focus more on machinery? And it happens to be, yeah. There, I happen to notice one that's that's uh, recommended for greases and oils. Yeah. See, here you go. Retention. See. See, see they're saying F10, F11, F12. Also recommended for dust shields. Yeah, see, that's us. So that's pretty good. So Starts with dust and everything everything up to coolant. <laughs> yeah, so they're saying uh, we can use here F10, F11. Okay, and, 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 and it's ironic. Just from a personal, no knowledge point of view, the F10 is actually my favorite. Yeah. It's cozy. I enjoy it. I like its color and the feel. Right. And I can just feel it wanting to absorb something and keep things away, and I kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so it's really important. We're just showing you it's really important to select a proper grade, you know, for the application. We do use felt products for other uses. We're just showing you what one example of what we're currently working on besides leaven. Okay, so I just kind of wanted to share that. Okay, Thank you. so we go back to the leaven rings, and this is what's really interesting. What we want to share with you. Okay, if you notice, you notice a light color and a dark color uh, ring right here. Okay, and these are actually two different grades. The white one's actually very soft. See, I can bend it really easy. And then this one's really rigid. It's really hard. So there's two different grades, a hard grade and a soft grade. Okay, but this is what's really interesting. We don't mix and match the grades. No. You know, with the or the sets with the different spindles. So the reason why we haven't laid out like this is because this is for one specific spindle, another, another. So we keep track you know, where they go on what particular spindle. And this is what's really interesting is, if you notice, okay, this is actually the front of the spindle. Oh, can you just put those, why don't you just put those two caps up here? Oh, you could do that or the caps. Oh, and the caps Put the too. cap that goes in the back and the cap that goes in the front. Oh, let's see, I mean like this. There you go. There we go, that's that better. That looks familiar. <laughs> there you go, okay. that's better. Yeah, because these are the caps that hold the felt rings. Yeah. Okay, and the retainer clips. Okay, so we got the front, and the rear. Okay, that's better. So I don't get mixed up. Okay, so if you notice here, so for this spindle that was purchased from Levin years ago, you'll notice Levin put a hard grade felt for the rear and a soft grade for the front. Okay, but then in another spindle <laughs> we own, they use both a hard grade for front and rear. But yet on another spindle, they use a soft grade for both the front and the rear. And I asked Patrick earlier, right? I said, is, was that an option on the machines when they were ordered, the spindles when they were ordered, but you know Leving so well. Yeah, no. It is it, not an option. It was never an option. You you just got what came to you. Right, so I just thought it was a good question to ask, but nope. Yeah, so even Levin, what it shows you is even Levin played with the grades. They're experimenting. Nobody has all the answers, I'm yeah. convinced. They had a, probably had some complaints about something happening. Sure. They said, hey, let's beef up. One of the solutions we could probably do is go ahead and beef up the uh, the hardness. Sure. And see if that's more resilient, you know, or something like that. Yeah, and see what we don't know here is we don't know which one's the older spindle and so forth. Nah. So so we don't know where they made the, these decisions. But mm -hmm. it is really interesting. We don't know the order. Yeah, we don't know the order. But but really interesting, isn't it? That is neat. We just wanted yeah. to share that because you don't know what that's gonna happen right now. I'm well, I'm gonna go change into a real blue colored workman's coat. Get out of this white one here. Sure. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna heat. Have to heat up the uh, distilled water a little bit. I gotta get to get it to a nice lukewarm temperature to mix with the uh, wool light. Oh, because that'll add to the uh, the cleaning power. It right? will. Yeah. And then I'm gonna show you how to properly clean 
rinse, clean, rinse, dab dry, and let rest so that you're safe and will not ruin your felts in any way and be able to easily reinstall them into the machine. Unless yours are so far gone, but we'll explain that out there. Okay, great. You know, I don't think I've seen this whole process, so I'm kind of interested. Uh oh, I hope I, I hope I get it right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Bye. Okay, I've got a blue coat on. That means I'm out in the machine shop area where I'm doing this cleaning for you. Um, I've already uh, heated to a point where you literally, it's just, it's not boiling water. If you can see my finger here, I'm not like screaming. And this is just water, nothing in it, right? This is pure distilled water, exactly two cups. Okay. Okay, and we're just going to soak one set at a time so we can, because they can't get mixed up. So I'm going to soak one set at a time, okay? And, the, and we, I've come up with this conclusion that we're going to soak these for 10 minutes. Okay. In, in just pure warm water. And because we're gonna get, we're working on getting rid of a lot of foreign objects here, right? We're getting rid of a lot of oils, greases, little chips, little chips, metals, plastics, whatever, right. waxes, whatever has been machined over the years. A lot of waxes are machined with this style of machine. So yes, so so uh, this we'll, this is gonna take about ten minutes for these to soak before we can start with the uh, the uh, wool light water, hot warm water collection. So uh, we'll be back. Great, sounds good. Okay, we're back. It's been a, been soaking in the warm water for about 10 minutes. This distilled two cups of warm water. Still hot, still warm to the fingers touch right here. And uh, what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna take them out of here so they're they're saturated at this point. Okay. We're gonna sit them on this uh, towel here for just a second. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna pat them dry. And here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Uh, what we're doing now is we're creating a sponge effect, but yet they're moist. So they're going to stay moist. We're going to move them pretty quick here. Yeah, sir. We don't want, we don't want them to dry out completely. No, no. We want them wet. Yeah, that was why yeah. we soaked them because I figured out this was the best formula. Okay. Okay, but they're still wet. But what they are is they're like a sponge right now because what's going to happen is you notice there's a second bowl here. Yeah. Another two cups of distilled water. Again, ah, pretty warm. Okay. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this wool light, which is a hand wash only wool light delicate. Oh yeah. You were saying there's like five or six products. They make five models from baby formula one to uh, dark only one. Okay. So that's important. They got to purchase the delicates version, right? Yeah. Well, I call this the rich man's laundry detergent because it, it isn't, it, it costs money. It's not cheap. Yeah, it's expensive for a tiny bottle. It is. You can get this anywhere. Well, they have it at your big, big uh, box stores, you know, Walmart's. Whatever. Sure. Okay. And it's hand wash only, and it's hyperallergenic, and you can only use this. And I'm, and I'm, and we, we're going to give you that in details. But we, what we're going to do right now is we're going to mix a quarter of this cup. This, there's lines in here. Okay. To trust me on that, a quarter of this cup into that two cups of that distilled water. There you go. Okay. okay. We're just going to mix it in. This is going to get you. Watch. Where's all them bubbles? Watch this. Okay, we're getting it ready now. And what's happened is with the wool light in the two cups of here. Put that back. Oh, yeah. I can see there's no color at all. No color and no no suds. Yeah, no suds, oh, color. Beautiful. Oh, I, I can smell the can scent. Can you smell it? Yeah, it smells it really smells good. It's going to make the shop smell good. I mean, there's a positive here. <laughs> You just mix it around. Your, I, we don't wear gloves here for some of these things. We like to feel some of what we're doing. That's true. Um, okay, you just agitate it so you're mixing it together because it's really hard to tell, but I can tell by my finger, okay? Okay. Okay, again. Okay, that's done. Okay, now remember, that's wool light with warm water, distilled water. These are like two little sponges right now, just slightly dried but still very damp. Okay. I'm going to drop them in, and they're going to sink around. Now... This takes, this is, these are going to... Oh, gonna, yeah, they sunk right to the bottom. Notice they didn't float like before, yeah. huh? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that, that's good. That means that whatever they did, they probably absorbed the wool light. See, and that's what we're trying to do, get that wool light in there. And then you're going to... Oh, that's why you dampen first, because you want the detergent to absorb in there. Yeah. Got but, you. but I don't want it to go, we determined that we didn't want it to go straight into warm water with, with uh, wool light and without being damp first because I think that's sucking too much wool light into the, I don't really want that much wool light. I don't really want that much uh, detergent in anything. Sure. Just We're just doing the gent more gentle thing here because I, I gotta save these. 
And uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna use your finger, and once in a while, just over the next, this is gonna take 15 minutes. And over the 15 minutes, just come and go, come back out, do whatever you're doing. Just come by and agitate them a little bit, flip them over, you know, like kind of like, I don't know, like cooking onion rings. <laughs> <laughs> And just move them around, and they're, what they're doing okay. is you're just helping them. You're agitating it, and uh, we'll be back. Great. Okay. See you then. Okay. All right. Well, we're back. It's been 15 minutes. We've been working these, agitating them, working them, agitating them, spinning them around, as I'm doing right now. This is in the wall right here. Uh, so you see that. Right? And while I was out... I went ahead and got another two cups of distilled water, heated and poured out the old water, and put fresh water in this fresh clean bowl, two cups of, of distilled water, because this is how we're going to start the, we're going to start the, uh, like the rinse, the, like the rinse cycle. You're just a human wash machine. I was yeah. almost going to put the Maytag sticker on my forehead. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just take them out of here carefully. Okay. We're going to do a lot of these. Okay, so, okay, so we're done with the wool light in wa hot warm water. Okay. okay, and I'm sure it's full of lots. You can just tell you can't see it, but there's a layer on there. Uh, so that's what happens. Okay, and what we're going to do is what we're doing again is we're creating a sponge effect. And you're going to do this. You're going to be playing in here for 10 or 15 minutes. But it's up to you. 10 minutes is what we do. And we put them in for a few minutes. We agitate them around kind of like a wash machine. We take them out and we pat them dry to create the, the uh, sponge effect. That's not like you're cleaning the sponge. Yeah, you, you go. Let it absorb water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you go, oh, squeeze out. That's squeeze right. out. That's right. So that's exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm creating a sponge. See, I'm going to put these sponges in this beautiful, warm, distilled water right here. Right? Okay. See, they look pretty good, by the way. They're really, for not having any bleaches in here now, phosphates and bleaches in the wool light, this look pretty good. Yeah, they do. Remember, this isn't a heavy, aggressive detergent at all. So we're going to go in for our first dip. See, they take, well, look at, see? See how dry I got them? Yeah. See, I'm dry. Oh. Yeah, look at that. See, we're, we're doing the rinse cycle. <laughs> okay, and yeah, you're agitating them so they absorb water. Yeah. And this is just pure, clean, distilled water. Right, and every couple of minutes, just... After, play with them a little bit, or all you want, whatever you're seeing, whatever you feel. Sure. Okay. Your your, your felts may not be like ours, and we you see we have different levels of felt, so we're going to be doing different little tests here. Nothing's a rule book. It's just whatever you feel it. That's sure. why we use our fingers and no gloves. Okay. So like, okay, so let's let's just say after a few minutes, what you're going to do is you're going to take them out again. You're going to pat them dry to create the sponge effect, put them back in the, the warm water, keep, and keep that up for about 10 minutes worth of time, so you, maybe you've done it three or four times here, okay. and, and we'll be back. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, I'm glad you got out here when you did. We're, you know, I just want to move that to empty anyway. Um, I'm, we're down to just the warm two cups of distilled water sitting here with the... Uh, felt still in here and you'll notice that they're beginning to become buoyant and float see that oh yeah look at that this one here looks like it's finally sinking again it takes a little bit but they'll they'll uh they'll stay up there pretty easy that means they're getting more buoyant this means that they're they've re almost all that foreign matter has been removed you know we've played the agitator with the soaps and the deter rather the detergents and the water Right. And we've patted them dry and we flipped them over like pancakes and we've patted them, which I'm going to do right now. See, I'm going to do one right now because I've been doing these for 10, it's been 10 minutes, by the way. And that's why you're here. And the total elapsed time of this project, so you know from start to finish, is 35 minutes. And uh, I have a lot more respect today than I did in, even as early as yesterday about for the wash machine. I, di I didn't realize how much work a wash machine has to do. It has to agitate, which I've done with my fingers. It has to do the soaping and the... The, dry, the spinning, in my case, it's padding dry. And uh, so I do respect the washing machine much more, huh, Patrick? That's a lot of cycles, huh? Yeah, it was. And it's just, it's all right. But uh, there's no rush. In fact, there's such no rush. I want to emphasize something. Be sure we want to retain our roundness. So be sure when you place these on these nice clean towel, because they're going to take you about 24 hours to dry. Now, it could be longer or less. I don't want to use any artificial heat like blow dryers, as Patrick says. And I like to say the blow gun, <laughs> yeah. blow torch. 
torch. Blow torch, all those things. Get, lamp. Yeah. Don't use anything. Don't let it naturally dry overnight. Yes, please. And uh, and and make sure they stay round. Once they once you've got them laid out on this paper towel and they're perfectly round, they're not going to change. Just leave them. Find a warm, safe place, to, a natural place to leave them sitting. Mars will be dry in an hour because we live in a desert. But that's okay because you've got another job to do. There's no rush waiting for those. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove this bowl that, we're, that we used to hold the soap. The second cycle. And I'm going to bring up my favorite glass, which is a glass I use to do all our sanding, but it's clean. Don't worry. Sure. And here's what you need to get into. We have the... Uh, the, the we have the... Uh, Dust covers are also called the uh, bearing caps. Bearing caps for the uh, for the for the uh, spindle, and these are those little press uh, pressed in rings of the soft aluminum. They're uh, press fit. Yes. Okay, and these are the little rings, the little uh, retainer rings to hold the felt in. And you know what? I, what you can do is remember, you cannot do anything on this outside because that's your press area, and I don't want you to do anything on the inside because I want to keep the felt as protected as possible. I don't want too much felt sticking out. Sure. And on the back, you want to leave it alone. But on that front, while you're waiting, you can make a nice, pretty finish. This is I do did, did, I do a brush finish on this one right now. But what you also need to do where you're here, because when you remove them, sometimes they get bent. So sure. what this class is going to let you do is the rocking test. You can just I do everything by hand because these are really soft, right, Patrick? You know, you don't they need are. a press or a hammer or pliers. Because they are only aluminum. They're just a real soft aluminum, and I just take them off the edge with a little rocking, and I just give them a little tweak. And I bring them back and I test them again. And I flip them over and make sure I'm not, you know, doing a good job. Okay, I will admit, personally, and this is just me, you know, if there's like a really sharp bend in here. Because, you know, if you have a really sharp bend, it's really hard to straighten it with yes. your fingers. Okay, in that case, I would put it like on a, on a flat metal surface. And it's very lightly with a flat head hammer. Just tap it a little to get that out. But, but other than that, try your best with just your fingers. Okay. It really is soft. That's okay. good. That's good advice. So that's it. I'm all done with this process. Remember again, it was 35 minutes. Um, I just love this wool light statement here. It says, "Clothes look new for longer." I say, "Our felts look new for longer." <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Put a trademark on that. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. Well, thank you for sharing that. That was really helpful. Okay. Okay. Well, we're back from from uh, cleaning the felts. Right? And it's the next day. Yeah, it's been at least 24 hours. Yep, they're very dry now. Yeah, should I show them the result? Yeah, I think you should. They're pretty good for what they are. Okay. And Pat has a few theories he wants to share, too. About why there's different felts, huh? Yeah, I think they turned out really well. Yeah. Okay, here's the felt. And, yeah, look how clean they are. I mean, even these, I mean, if I touch them, I mean, perfectly clean, dry... No oil grease anymore. Um, yeah, very good job. You know what's funny when they're when they're cleaned out really well, even when they're damp, and they, they start floating on the water. Yeah, that was interesting. You could not once they are perfectly clean, you could not make them sink. So it kind of told me, okay, these are clean like inside and out. Yeah, that's pretty neat. That was yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, we just want to uh, real quick a couple of observations. Um, oh, can I share just so that you, then you can go. Oh sure. Is I, I went with the brush finish here on these on the uh, retention rings. Yeah, the condition you found they're all perfectly flat, but you just wanted to kind of clean them up. Yeah, just just the flat surface, and of course I didn't touch the ODs because of their press fits. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Never yeah, see he didn't touch the outside edge because that's what you know it's a press fit, and by if he touched it too much, you know we may lose that. Um, little nice fitting. Yeah, it snaps in really neat. Yeah. It's unbelievable that little thing snaps in, but it sure does. It sure does. Okay, go ahead. Um, oh, just one uh, one note. Uh, okay, actually, let me share with you. Let me tell you what these spindles go to. Okay, this is uh, okay. This spindle uh, with the nice, clean, soft uh, felt rings. This was actually the latest spindle we we disassembled in front of you, and we. It almost it looks like a new old stock. It looked like it, when we disassembled the parts, they look like the parts look like the the grinding attachment had never been used. Right? And we didn't and we didn't know this going into filming. Yeah, you don't know until you disassemble no. it, right? So, so we just got lucky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this is a eleven accessory spindle, which is really part of their grinding attachment. Okay. 
This uh, accessory spindle actually goes to Levin's micro drill accessory. Oh. Okay. And then, and then that was interesting where we observed where, unlike this one, where they use soft grade felt rings for both sides, they use harder grade. Okay. And then this is our oldest uh, accessory spindle. And this is also a grinding attachment. And this is what was interesting that we pointed out was they use both a combination of a soft felt for the front and a harder grade for the rear. Okay. And oh yeah, when you cling when you cling all your felt rings, uh, sometimes like see this is our oldest spindle. You'll notice it, uh, it's stained from the grease. Yeah, but there's none in there. Yeah, there's none in there. If I pick this it's up, just color. Yeah, it's just color. It's just stained. But there's no, there's no grease, oil. Well, I don't want you, I, here, let me put, I don't want to see you do this with where I'm doing my fingers with the felt in between them or something. Don't, don't work the felt with your fingers. Yeah, I guess what we're It'll saying. It'll disassemble. But what we're saying is if you see staining, leave it. Don't Please. try to rub, yeah, what Lance is saying is don't try to rub it out, like trying to get it perfectly clean because we don't want this form, you know, to get damaged. Yeah, and it will. Yeah, and it will. Okay, so off camera, you know, after Lance, you know, I cleaned all these, off camera, Lance and I were, you know, we were talking about, you know, the grades, you know, it's like, because we had mentioned to you guys before, you know, it's interesting that the grades of these felt rings have changed over the years. But then we were wondering, you know, we can just make assumptions. We don't know what, uh, what thoughts Levin had when they were trying different grades. No. But it is interesting to note that, you know, on the latest grinding attachment, which is basically uh, definitely a later, this grinding attachment's definitely a later year than this older grinding attachment. So it's interesting that they went with soft felts for both sides. Okay, but for the, for the spindle that's used for the micro drill accessory, see we wonder if they chose a harder grade because it's a different application. You know, maybe they didn't need that soft felt to hug the spindle uh, for for the drilling application, but they need it for the grinding application because they really wanted that seal for the grinding dust. And that's a good probable reason. I think that was a good good idea you had. Yes, right. See, where the drying, it's worth mentioning it. See, for the, for, for, whereas for the drilling accessory, you're just drilling, and maybe they didn't want the, uh, you know, the resistance. Right. You know, the, the, um, so, or well, the friction. So yeah, so just a couple of interesting observations. But other than that, uh, we're, we're really happy with them. They're perfectly dry. And if we wanted to, we, we could install these right now. Yeah, they're ready. Yeah, they're ready. Just be so, sure they're, they're completely dry. Do not rush, please. Yes. Okay, so back to you. <laughs> All right, well, that was, that was a great explanation. That's really neat thinking there. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess I can just close this one out now, huh? Um, I got an article that I'd like to share with everybody. Oh yeah, that's interesting. Some okay. some viewers may really enjoy this. In doing all of this research in the felts and in the preparation for cleaning the felts and even even the details on how you would hollow punch, I believe you call it. Oh yeah, that's a that's a good point. You know, if we if we da if we had damaged these felts or maybe uh, we purchased a used spindle that didn't have the felts, but we wanted to put felts in the spindle. Or if Levin said they were mandatory, which they no longer think they even need. So right. there was a couple of reasons why we went with these old things. As you know, we always replace every single fastener felt, bushing, bearing, period, always. Right. On all all rebuilds. But see, like we told you, we that Levin discontinued the felt, so they don't have them in stock. I think they have a few in stock. Like I think when I had contacted them for the open style headstock, I think they only had the front seal for the front of the spindle and that was it. They didn't have the two internal or the rear felt ring. So yeah, so just basically count on Levin not having them. Yeah, that's what's so, gonna end up happening. Yeah, so if we if we were in a position where we had to custom make these, uh, okay, normally you would purchase some hollow punches and with the hollow punches, you know, you would stamp, you know, the internal dimension, the external, external dimension and you'd have your felt ring. Okay, but in our case, we did some measuring of all these felt rings and they're very unusual sizes, you know, like 12.4 millimeter. You know, they aren't like, you know, and that's a problem, you know, especially in metric, this is um, metric uh, measurements, by the way. Um, you know, usually if, if you buy metric hollow punches, they're only available in very standard sizes, like 10, 12, 14 millimeter. Yeah. So you aren't gonna get fractional or, 
you know, sizes in between. So in that case, we would have to make the hollow punches ourselves. You have to turn them on a lathe and then do your, like you said, it reminded me, we have to heat treat them because we're going to use them as a punch. Right. We'd have to heat treat them because if you don't heat treat them, you know, it has a very thin uh, lip because that lip is what cut, would cut the felt. And if you don't heat treat it properly and use a proper material, like, you know, um, O1 uh, uh, tool steel, you know, uh, it would just disintegrate, you know, it would just really dull really quick. Yeah. So, no, good point. And then we share uh, the different grades in much more detail in regards to the area of, of what we call pressed, which are what, what are used in machines or pressed, but there's a whole, there's a whole story, an article section on our website in that on that specialized page for this whole rebuild, right? That's right. So it's quite a lengthy one. Since I'm doing it, I went ahead and made it into a, a, a basically a, a whole article, a yeah, long, hard whole article. But it also decided to recognize somebody who made this all possible today, and that was the inventor of that wall light and his whole history. Did you know? Just to share a little piece. We live in Southern California, and he lived when he at the time when he died, he was very young, and he lived in one of the fanciest cities in Southern California in Corona del Mar. Sure, beautiful beach yeah. town, and right just very south nice. of Newport. It's actually the upscale area of Newport Beach, actually, but it's Corona del Mar. It's a beautiful right. area, beautiful home. Yeah. So anyway. I uh, just wanted to share all that, and all that shared in there, so it's a nice little story worth reading. And later on, right now it'll be on, it's up, the article. But later on, there'll be an audio version of this you can easily just download and uh, listen to me tell a story, I guess. Sure. That's our second article already. Yeah. Second audio article. Yeah, audio article. We've done, one, we've done the other one on right. new old stock. So yeah. Okay, okay, that's it. All right, on to the next step. Part 3, Section 3, Measuring the Spindle for Runout. Okay, great. So at this stage, we cleaned all the, or you cleaned all the parts, you cleaned the felt rings, and that, that's a good point. The other thing we didn't show is you did clean the spindle as well. I spend most of my time on that. Okay. Well, that's right. I think we even mentioned even the spindle looked beautiful. That's yeah, right. Yeah, they do, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But they're always where I, I spend a lot of time because they're, they're really the base. That's right. Everything around it. Right. It, that's my take. I mean... Just, no, you're right. It is that main component that's so so important. It can tell you a lot. If it if, if something doesn't look right here, you're probably going to see something not look right, I don't know, on, on a bearing knot. You just you start seeing things and you might find something in one of these housings. It's just, it just it's sure. a story to be told, I think. And that's a good point. It comes with experience. I like that. So, okay, yeah. What we're going to measure... Well, okay, what we're concerned about it, for measuring is... We want to focus on runout conditions. Uh, you know, what we're looking for is if the spindle's bent, uh, uh, out around, you know, things like that. But I can tell you, in case of in the case of these Levin spindles, very unlikely that you're going to see any runout issues or a bent spindle. Um, and even in our experience, you know, we've rebuilt about 20 11 spindles and we've never rejected 11 spindle. Okay, we have seen minimal run out, especially on these larger 11 spindles. You know, you'll see slight run out, but, but it's still within the factory tolerances that for a good, yeah, and nothing's we, and perfect. And we've seen a lot of abuse, but, but still, still not rejectable. Still, That's, after when you're doing the rebuild and the grinding and everything, we're just bringing it back. So, right. we, so far, we've been lucky. Yeah, we've been really lucky. You don't want to buy one of these, by the no. way. No. And especially, and especially the accessory spindle. I mean, it's so small. <laughs> it, would be, it would be so... Which one's your favorite, Patrick? Okay, I don't think I have a favorite. Maybe this little one? Yeah, it would be maybe the little <laughs> one. <It's> the tiny. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as you can see, to, uh, to bend that, even if you drop the whole assembly no. you wouldn't bend it yeah so and and really uh if i if we think yeah although we haven't seen spindle issues there is an issue we've seen that's related to the spindle and that's what i want to share with you guys okay that's why when you buy a used lathe and from any manufacturer you know you want to be sure it's not a rust bucket you know, or a former rust bucket in hiding. Yeah, or in hiding, you know, because what's happened, and 
we've seen this from other people um, and I've act, we've actually rebuilt one headstock for a friend and it had this condition. Yeah. Okay. And what happened is, let's just take this, uh, this is a Levin open style headstock. That's a good example of this. Yeah, this is yeah. a good example. He bought a used Levin lathe with this spindle type and it was really rusted, really bad condition. You know, he bought it. Once he, uh, once it arrived, he de-rusted it, cleaned it all up, scraped the rust, you know, and, you know, and brought it to you know good condition fairly good condition okay but the problem is is because you know because of the rush rust issue he had to remove material obviously you know to clean it all up and what happened was you know because he had a lot of rust on the inside housing that supports the bearing well once it was all clean and ready to assemble when we installed the bearings, the bearings had some play in the housing. Yeah, it just didn't and have enough pressure. That's right. They're very loose. I mean, we could we could tell immediately there was an issue because when I pushed the bearings in, they went in too easily, you know. And then with the spindle attached, you could just feel the play, and and that's a really bad issue. For him, it was more of a hobby, so he just accepted the condition and went on with life. But um, but but, but that's we just wanted to share our experiences with you because that is something to look for. It you is. know, don't get something, don't purchase a used lathe that's so severe. You know, with rust and right, know, and, and there'll so be other cool. opportunities to come along and be a little bit easier on you. Yeah, so. Um, Okay. Oh, did you want to share your experience? Yeah, these these cute little spindles are something. But okay, so so let's let's go back in my time when I was working with my father there at, uh, at the aerospace company there, and we had the vertical milling machines. Yeah, a couple of horizontal, most yeah, vertical, mostly vertical, and uh, big, uh, you know, fifty taper stuff. Right, and we're talking a really major horsepower, seventy five horsepower yeah, plus. Yeah, some of them got really big. Yeah, a lot of them yeah. were just twenties, and there was all the way yeah, some seventy big, big stuff. Right. With really big, long, you know, you, okay, I know spindles, you know, so you'll see a 12-inch spindle, an 18-inch spindle, height now, length, overall length. A 24-inch spindle, I've seen 36, and 48-inch spindles. Wow. Okay, and they're huge, and they've got stacks of bearings at the bottom, stacks of bearings at the top. And when they overheat, they overheat. They turn glowing red. They actually glow. They can glow. Sparkler, I've seen it all. I've right, seen because, seizures, but the motor's still running. No matter what you do, that direct right. drive motor. There's so much force, oh. so much power behind. I mean, the bearings may want to lock up or, you know, uh, freeze, but that power is not going to let in. It's and I've had the ceramic, I've even had uh, uh, 50 taper uh, uh, spindles, you know, with their ceramic explode. Just literally explode. <laughs> it's really, <laughs> it's really like a war zone. Yeah. I can see why today's... Uh, Machines have all those guards and protective things on them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> anyway, when they get that hot or they hit, they stop that hard with that motor still pushing. That's when you bend one of those spindles. That or you overheat it. Heat, you know, heat warps too. Right. There's a lot of things I've seen. I've gotten to see a lot in my lifetime. So that's right. So you, you, I couldn't imagine this happening. I don't. I can't put a scenario where this would happen. So that's why he's saying what he's saying to you. Right. Like even here. Okay. Actually, this is as big as we go. Levin still, ma they still make these spindles today. Okay, this is actually a 3C collet uh, spindle. This is a D collet spindle, both headstocks. And this is the 8 millimeter WW collet accessory spindle. So as you can tell, I mean, even, I mean, this is pretty small, but even the largest spindle Levin makes, it's tiny compared to what's in the industry. Oh, yeah. You know, in a this professional is... shop. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you aren't going to, you know, you aren't going to, you aren't going to see much damage in no. eleven with the eleven machines. No, you don't have the yeah. horsepower behind it. You don't have all that. That's right. Even the horsepower, it's only fractional horsepower. You're driving these. We just thought it was a good experience, though, just to share share what you know, because this is just general spindle rebuilding. It applies to all spindles, but there is that one area where this does not apply. Right. So you're lucky if you have one of these on that case. But yeah. as far as taller scale, these are far more high tolerance. Sure. So you got a little trade-off, you know. Yeah, fair. <laughs> yeah, fair. That's fair. Hey, we're going to measure something, aren't we? Yeah, I think that's it. Um, I think we're ready. So let's go ahead and do some measuring. Uh-oh. <laughs> All okay. right. Okay, we're ready to measure a little accessory spindle. 
this little guy over here. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this single V block over here. This is from Brown and Sharp, so it's a quality precision ground uh, V block. And as because as you can see, our spindle's pretty small, you know, so this will work perfect. However, if we were doing 11 headstock spindle, such as this, okay, that's where you'll need a matched pair of V blocks. And, and that's why we say it's really important to have a matched pair. It's for this application. So, see in this case, let me get a better view for you. So in this case, we would use them like that. Uh, what we do is, we like to stay away from the threads. We want to be sure, you know, there's no interference with the threads when we're taking our measurement. So we just want to stay on the smooth spindle portion. And um, so just like that. Okay, so we just wanted to show that to you. But in our case, we're just going to use one block. Oh, the other th uh, note I want to make is, you'll see this little block over here. This is actually one of those no-name, inexpensive V-blocks. You know, and it comes in this little set. See, and it, it is a matched pair, but, um, and they're good, you know, they're good for, like, you need a pair of V-blocks that you really don't care about dropping or or you want to use them to machine because you know they come with little brackets that you can clamp the part on and do a little simple machining like a keyway or something they're perfect for that but you don't want to use them for inspection purposes such as what we're doing here and I'm going to show you why you don't is because uh, they do have some tolerance issues you know I'm sure it's still it's within the tolerance uh, from the factory uh, but um, here, I'm going to show you, you know, where they can drive you crazy. Okay, so let me set this up. Okay, that should be good. Let's make sure plate's smooth. You always make sure, you know, before you set your stuff on, make sure you wipe the table with your hand. Make sure the dust is out of the way. You know, rub the bottom of the feed block. You know, and slide it, make sure, okay, it's all good. Okay, we're just going to take, let's take a reading. Um, okay, we're about 65. Okay, see that? Okay, 65. Okay, so I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to the front of the spindle up here. Okay, so yeah, okay, we have about 67. Now so, each mark's one micron, right? That's right, one micron each division. Okay. And that's roughly about 40 millionths of an inch. Okay. Okay, but check this out. Okay, so that's, okay, so we, so our base lying in the center was 65. Now we got 67. I'm going to pull it out and lift the spindle, turn the V block around 180 degrees, set it back down. And suddenly, and now it's like 60, about 60. So the condition we have is, you know, it's not perfectly parallel to the bottom. It's like a little ramp. Okay, again, it's not significant. So one side 60, the other side 67. What, so that's 7 micron. 7 micron, you know, is what? So we're talking about 2.8 ten thousandths of an inch. So it's minimal, but still, you know, when you're doing very precise measurements like we, we're doing here, you know, those are the type of things that's going to drive you nuts, you know. So just want to make a point of that. Okay, let me, so that's why um, we're really happy with these brown and sharps. Uh, uh, we get really good results with these, so if you're interested. Um, let me go ahead and set the, I need to readjust the height of the height gauge. So let me do that and we'll come right back. Okay. Okay, we're ready to take our run out measurements. But before we get started, uh, I just want to make a couple of notes. Okay, when I set the angle of the stylus on our test indicator, you'll notice that it's pretty much parallel to the surface plate. Okay, and the reason for that is uh, you always want the stylus to be perpendicular to the work area you're measuring. So in this case, you know, we want to measure the top of the spindle. So that's why we have the stylus about, you know, basically perpendicular is 90 degrees. 
Okay, we have a little play there, but what we don't want, and we all do this, you know, we do it here, you know, it just seems more natural. Let's say my finger was a test indicator stylus, you know, you know, we always want to go into an angle like this. And, you know, that's a big no-no. What, what happens is you start running into cosine errors. So what that, tra you know, translates to is uh, you don't get accurate readings. So just want to mention that. So that's what that's why we have set up like that. Okay, the other thing is, uh, just want to clarify that here, uh, we're only testing for runout conditions. So we're only making runout measurements. Okay, after we're done here, we're going to go back to the table. And at the table, we're going to take dimensional readings where the bearings sit. And we just want to ensure that, you know, the dimensions accurate so we get enough you know we want the bearings to seat very well we don't want the bearings to be loose on the spindle so that's a measurement we're going to be taking over at the table next okay so i think we're ready to start measuring okay if we look at this little spindle there's three points where we want to take our run out readings okay what we like to do is we first like to take a reading in the center and that's kind of like our baseline reading and uh, so we like to take that reading first. Okay, on this particular spindle, you know, we only have one pair of angular contact bearings where one bearing sits in the front right here and the other one sits in the rear right here. So one bearing there, one there. Okay, okay. so the, uh, when we, the second and third reading is going to be where the bearings seat. So be one. In, so the first reading will be in the center. Second one will be the, where the front bearing sits. Third reading will be where the rear bearing sits. So let's go ahead and get started with the center first to get our baseline uh, reading. Okay. By the way, this is really sensitive, so you gotta uh, you know take this slowly and to just take your time. Okay. You notice the reading we're currently seeing is 62. Okay, that means nothing. We don't care about that number. When we take a run out measurement, what we're looking for is movement. Okay, so what we want to do very carefully is just hold the V block, make sure it doesn't move, and very carefully we want to turn the spindle one full revolution. Okay, so okay, I'm turning it, I'm almost about halfway. Okay, and looking at the needle, I'm not seeing any movement at all. Yeah, that's a real good thing. Yeah, this is very good news. But again, it's a small little spindle. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's good. I definitely made a full revolution. Okay, so, so far so good. So we come out. Okay, now we want to basically go about the center area where the bearing uh, seats. Okay, there we go. 62 again. Okay, if you guys wonder why when he does this setups, he doesn't uh, turn d zero out the indicator dial. Um, that's because um, that, that he does. That's because uh, if you even just touch that dial, you'll throw this right out. Yeah, it's so sensitive. Yeah, we don't want to touch it. So we just pick up wherever it reads and check it. That's three, right. Three times. Okay, there we go. So I'm just turning the loops. See, you just, I just. You know, I tap, I bumped into it, and my readings are all messed up. So you've got to start from the beginning again. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, there we go. So just really slow. Okay, again, I'm not seeing any... Really boom. nice reading. Yeah, really nice reading. Wow, that's really good. Okay, I've made a full revolution. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to turn this around. Okay, and the rear bearing sits about right there. And final check. Yep, okay. Okay, again, I'm not seeing, oops, I think that's me. Okay, let's 
picture. Okay, there we go. Yeah, no movement whatsoever. Now they're beautifully smooth. You yeah, see, you gotta have really sensitive light fingers. Cause see what happens is if I just put too much there's a light pressure on the top of this, of the spindle. But if when I'm turning it, oops here. See it, the needle moves. See just like that. See, that's how easy the needle And it looks like it's moving a whole lot. It's it's only like what, five microns? It's, it's just yeah, not. Yeah, you got to remember, remember, one division is one micron, which what is roughly 40 millionths of an inch. So so if you look at from 70 to 60, what, that's 10 microns, uh, that would be about four tenths. So very, yeah, so we're talking, so that's why it's so sensitive. So no, so that's really good. I think uh, um, I'm not detecting any needle movement. So that's very good news. And that's pretty much what, what we anticipated, especially with this spindle. Because even visually, like we told you, visually after you clean all the parts, that in itself is a pretty good indicator what to expect. You know, there's no rust or anything. So, um, so that's it, we're done here. We're gonna go back to the table and continue. Great. Okay, we're back. Okay, before we proceed, I just want to mention, as you notice, we could not detect any runout on the small little spindle. And due to that, we couldn't mark a high spot because, yeah. you know, if you can't detect any runout, you can't mark any high spot. That's right. But, but we kind of know that from our past history of rebuilding these smaller spindles. We do know, and we are going to be rebuilding these, and we yeah. weren't going to film these because we've already showed you how to do it there. Right. But we're going to go ahead and here's what's going to happen. One of these, I'm pretty sure, if not these two, at least one of the other three or four we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> well, all at the same time here in this film videos, we'll have high spots. And what we're going to do is we're going to come back and we're going to film it during that rebuild. So That's right. So we'll share it with you. It just may be in a different spindle rebuild being done in the series here. And we make sure we do because I really want you to see what we mean by when we mark up these little high spots and how we conclude getting rid of them. What do we right. do about it? That's right. So, yeah, so especially if you're rebuilding an accessory spindle like this, it's pretty common not to see run out yeah. just because it's so small. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong yeah. when you're checking there. So I just want to mention What that. is this giant? Yeah, you know, <laughs> we're actually rebuilding this spindle for another machine. That's a BT-30. It is, it's a BT-30 spindle. Um, yeah, really nice. Um, it's actually, you cleaned it up and it's ready to get assembled. It's all ready but, to get going. Yeah, and the reason why we brought it out, because we wanted to show you a typical common spindle that you would see in a common machine, you know. Because what we wanted to point out was, you know, as I mentioned earlier, on the 11 spindles, you can't, when I say bearing journal, okay, bearing journal is usually the area on the spindle where the bearings get installed. Okay, on the 11 spindles, First, uh, as you can see, because they're set small spindles, there's no, you can't really tell there's bearing journals because basically the entire length is ground. Yeah, it's just easier. Yeah, just easier. Where Lance is pointing out here, see here you can see very easy to identify the bearing journals. See, it's, a, it's the area on the spindle that they grind, grind to specification and that's where the bearing seat or get installed and they you know live there and because there's no reason to grind you know the center area because there's nothing that gets installed right here and this is the most common style of, yeah. of spindles the way you see them when you're doing bearings not not these levens this is this is just an isolated case yeah because they're just too small right so great yeah so I just wanted to show that to you okay oh yeah so let's proceed and what we want to do is um, as I mentioned the last step now is we want to take a dimensional reading where the bearings sit. Okay, so on this spindle, uh, we only have a pair of angular contact bearings. So there's only going to be two locations. One where the bearing sits in the front and where it sits in the rear. Okay, but on the headstock bearings, uh, we got three places we got to measure. See, in the front, we have the pair of angular contact bearings that sit together. 
And in the rear, we had that single deep groove precision bearing. So three areas. The stabilizer, I call it. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so this is really easy. And we do remember, you know, I've been holding on to this. Temperature affects small items. Right, you know, one micron readings do get influenced by holding the part. That so keep that in mind. a big deal. Yeah. So, okay, so let's get started. Okay, what we have here is a Stara digital micrometer and it measures both in inches and metric. We're going to use metric, of course. And in metric mode, the resolution is one micron, just like the test indicator we use for measuring the run out. Okay, so yeah, we want to be sh that's the resolution we always want to use when we're working on spindles. Okay, the two areas, real quick, we want to measure is we want to measure about right here where the front bearing gets installed and right here where the rear bearing uh, gets installed or seats right here okay okay and the measure the measurement we're looking for is about 12 millimeter um about 12 yeah about 12 millimeter uh with a tolerance of minus two micron about right there oops wait okay about just under one micron okay it's probably the temperature because i'm holding it very sensitive you know yeah it's very sensitive that's why we're using the mic holder <laughs> yes yeah, so if i like get another area okay about the same okay we're back and i'm actually in lance's spot because i want to show you something okay when we were just measuring this little accessory spindle right now, and I was doing it on the platform, you know, we measured 12 millimeter, but under one micron. And I was really expecting under two micron because that's the readings we get when we measure any good Levin spindle being from this large one. And I got a few up here. I got the 3C, the D, and the little accessory spindle. And they should all read uh, the base measurement and then two microns under. And I just want to demonstrate that to you. And I want to show you, I've allowed these parts to just sit here. I haven't touched them. So I'm going to measure the same part in front of you. And I'm going to show you, I should now get two microns. And, and you're, and we're still in the same air control environment. Is that right? As you did over there? That's right. I'm glad you mentioned that. Remember, we do all our measurements, precise measurements, in this workshop where we maintain a cozy 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's really important as well. You know, you don't want to be in a really hot or really cold machine shop. So, and, um, okay, the first thing, I just thought I'd uh, make a couple of notes. When, okay, first of all, we're using a really good quality steric micrometer. These are the USA-made versions because they do have their international line. And... One, the first thing I want to mention is when you first turn on your micrometer, which these turn on when you just turn the thimble, you want to let them sit for a few minutes because they will drift. Uh, like these, both of these will drift, you know, uh, plus or minus one micron for at least like the first one or two minutes. I guess it comes up to temperature internally and then it stabilizes. So... I turn these on before we turn the camera on. So they've been sitting for about five minutes. So what I do next is I want to zero it out. So we'll go zero. See, this is already drifted negative one micron. Okay, and just double check it. Okay, there we go. So we should be good to go. Okay, we should read uh, 12 millimeter uh, minus two microns. There we 
we go. Got that, Lance? Spot on the money right there. See? Okay, that concludes this step, and we're almost done with this part. Ah, but we have one more item to do. It's a tiny one. It is. Somebody's going to get... A little collet key. They are. And you, we're going to use this one to share it. Yeah, uh, good point. Um, you know, all our accessory spindles, the collet keys are fine. They Perfectly don't need good. to be replaced. Not at all. And that's a good point. You know, unless they're worn or broke or, sh or had sheared. Had a crash. Yeah, yeah, had a crash or sheared off. That's when you want to replace them. Right. But if they're still in good condition, no reason to pop it out and put a new one in. No. Nope. So that's why in regards to all our accessory spindles, they're all ready to be assembled. Okay. So that's why for the next step, for the collet key replacement, uh, we're going to, I'm not sure which one we're going to do. One of these will do. Yeah, one of these. get a collet key yeah, for both you. Of, yeah, both of these need a collet key. So we'll just pick one. And then we'll do a demonstration for you to show you. Because they're the same. It, it's just a, it's just a little bit different, but they're the same. They're the same. Yeah. Yeah. Different. All there right. You okay. See you in a bit. Wow. We're over at the inspection area, as you can see to Patrick's left. He's got a slightly bigger spindle in his hand, which means something. What he wanted to do, and he worked really hard on it for you guys, he wanted to find you a spindle with a thing called a high spot so he could teach and share with you and understand what a high spot is, at least identify it for now. So Patrick, yeah. here's Patrick to explain what he's got. Okay, yeah, before we get into that, I just wanna reiterate a few things. Uh, and that's in regards to the Levin spindles. Uh, you know, it was really difficult to find one of our three headstock spindles with any type of run out. Uh, just because we mentioned before, uh, these spindles are made really well and you're unlikely, even with a one micron test indicator, you're, you're actually unlikely to find any run out. And if you do, it's gonna be so minimal, it's gonna be uh, very hard to detect, and it's gonna be well within the tolerance from the factory. So it's all pluses, you know, that's, that's really good, you know. And Lance and I were talking about it, and we really attribute uh, three main factors why there's little run out to no run out on these. And the number one factor that's most important is if, if you're fortunate enough to disassemble a leaven spindle and you know remove it and clean it, you're gonna be so surprised by the quality. It's just unsurpassed it, from it, in. It's just beautifully built both inside and out. All the way the length of that thing is like it's it's like it's glass. Yeah, I mean the smoothness, I mean it's just incredible. Just incredible workmanship out of leaven. So that's so, so that's that's a main factor why we think uh, there's that's minimal of any run out that you can detect. Okay, the second thing is, is the size. You know, especially the uh, first spindle we've been working on, the little accessory spindle, really tiny. Well, even the headstock spindles are pretty small, you know, when you compare them to other machine spindles. And it's that, it's a smallness that we think is another factor that contributes to minimal run out. Okay, and the third factor... Might be the biggest one, huh? Important too, yeah. This really is important really important one. too. Is remember this spindle is used in a micro machining precision environment. So that means you know these machines aren't being abused. They're machining very precision, tiny parts, and even the motors that are driving the machines are fractional horsepower motors. So all of those things contribute, you know, to very minimal to no run out. We think, but just the workmanship. The workmanship. I mean, it's class A1 workmanship. So, so okay. So, you know, we have three spindle headstocks we're rebuilding. You know, we have two closed style headstocks and an open style headstock. Okay, the open style headstock is actually a WW collet headstock. And then we have a D collet and a 3C collet closed style headstock. Okay, so uh, yesterday I went through all the actually went through all the spindles trying to find any kind of run out and I found run out well I should say I found detectable run out on one uh, headstock spindle. <laughs> Wait till you see what he had to do to find it. <laughs> right you know it was so difficult I actually had to use my uh, 10 power loop you know looking at the needle and slowly turning the spindle. Okay I want to turn it because I found that I had the high spot 
set right now. But that's how I had to use a loop to really focus on the needle and probably due to my age <laughs> to really detect any, you know, detect the movement to find that high spot. But it's so minimal, it's ridiculous. Okay, so this is just a reminder. This is the WW call it spindle for the open style headstock. So now that headstock, right, that, that spindle looks really familiar to this one that's not being rebuilt, doesn't need it. Yeah, that's right. Um, it, it, it's identical to this style, and, and it's identical every which way, all the parts, everything, with the exception of this spindle is a D call it spindle. Um, I just want to make a mention real quick. You'll notice because, you know, the headstock spindles are larger, I had to use two match pair V blocks. Okay, and just... Um, this is a helpful hint I want to share. When you use two blocks and such a small spindle, uh, okay, I gotta be careful not to turn the spindle, but if you move it around and bring it under the gauge, what you want to do is maintain downward pressure on the spindle so that way your two blocks stay aligned. See, if you don't, if you just move it, your blocks are going to get out of alignment. Oh, I see. It'll there. force it to move as one. That's right. No see? kinking, no angling, little angling or that's anything. Yeah. That's right. So you push it down, you know, you go over and you take your run out measurement. You know, go over here, you know, keeping downward pressure at all times and go over to your front area where the bearing is. Okay. So that's just, I thought that would be a helpful hint. Okay. So we're ready. Okay. I know that. The, the high spot of the spindle uh, where it has a maximum run out is on the very top right here. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to take a Sharpie, a permanent marker, very important. You don't want this witness mark to rub off by accident. Okay, what I do is I like to mark both the front and the rear of the spindle, but you don't want to mark the inside area, you know, where the bearings get pushed on because that's going to rub the marks off and, you know, we're handling that area too. So what I'm going to do is I just go here, make my little mark on the top like that. I mean it doesn't have to be so precise but pretty accurate. As, as accurate as you can get it. Okay just like that. So see we have a little witness mark up there that's our front of our spindle and back here. So that's all we're going to do and you know from now on, when you handle a spindle with witness marks, just be very careful that you don't rub it off. Because, you know, the spindle, I could take it off now. See, the spindle is very slippery and, and shiny and smooth. And even though this is a permanent marker, it will rub off. Part 3, Section 4. Replacing the collet key on the spindle. Well, that one gets me here because I know, and everybody probably realizes by now, we put new fasteners on bushings and bearings on just literally everything we do. True. <laughs> but not always on these spindles, do we? Some spindles get replacement keys and some do not. That's, that's true. And this is what we do and this is what we recommend is, for one, uh, we don't always replace the collet key. Okay, the first thing we do though is, uh, Okay, a lot of times uh, we actually find them completely gone, you know, so they, they'll either be missing, they'll be sheared off, okay, but if it, if it you is... Mean somebody wasn't just nice enough to, re to remove it for us in advance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, you know, in those, in those scenarios, you know what usually causes that is, especially the smaller uh, WW collet spindles, the smaller spindles, what happens is a user will put in like a three or four jaw chop. Oh, yeah. you know a larger chuck and then what they what happens is they don't tighten the draw bar hard enough so the chucks really loose and when and just because of the weight of the chuck just the momentum the force on just, just shears it right off and and so that's why you'll see um you'll see a lot of used lathes with just the key missing or sheared off due to that okay so if you're fortunate enough to have an, a collet key installed uh the first thing you want to do is uh Take a really good look at it, you know, put a flashlight in there, you know, maybe with a loop. I, I, what I do is I take a flashlight, you know, at the back and with my loop, I look at the key and what I'm checking for is I'm checking for wear and damage, you know. And most of the time I have to say, you know, when we do a rebuild, we probably have to replace maybe four, I'd say 40%. Okay. You know, maybe, you know, so almost half of the spindles we, we rebuild, we replace the key. That's really good. Okay. 
Okay, and when we have to replace a key, uh, we don't make the key ourselves. They're mm -hmm. cheap enough from Levin, and, um, and maybe I'll get a better view, show them what a key looks like. Okay, what I have here are two keys. I have the old key, and then I have the new key for, that we purchased from Levin. Okay, and what we're gonna do is, we decided that the 3C spindle, uh, it's a 3C, call it spindle for our 3C closed style headstock. Okay. Um, we want, we, we decided we're gonna replace it because if you take, let's see if I can get a better view of this. Okay, see so if I took, oh, actually let me bring the new one as well so we can make a comparison. Okay, so yeah, that's good. Okay, as you can see, first of all, you can definitely see where. Here, let me bring this next to it. Okay, as you can see how nice, how that has a lot of nice thickness to it, and where that one's really thin. Yeah, that, the new one's really defined there. See those edges? Yeah, and see even the top. If you can, if I can get that good, see even the top is really worn. See, so that's why we made the determination to buy a new one. See, that's really nice. That's why we made the determination that we were going to replace it. So, so what's the steps? Um, okay, first, most important is in all the Levin ball bearing style spindles, the keys are press fit only. They aren't riveted. And I stress that because in a lot of watchmaking lathes, the manufacturers uh, would rivet the key in. And so with that said, what happens is I've taken apart, you know, used Levin spindles and I've seen where prior users have replaced the key and they riveted the key in. And that's really bad because, you know, what they da you know, I've seen a lot of terrible damage, you know, where, you know, they fit the key in, you see hammer marks on the spindle. Grinding marks. Grinding marks. Oh. You know, because they want to make it flush. Yes. And oh god, it's just terrible. So Levin does not rivet. And I can only speak for the ball bearing uh, style spindles. You know, because um, prior to the ball bearing style spindles, you know, Levin's first watchmaker lathes were cone bearings. Right. And I've never taken, never owned, we've never owned a cone bearing style headstock Levin lathe. So I can't, I, you know, I can't tell you for sure what they did at that era. So, but in all ball bearing spindles, style spindles, it's all press fit. So we just need to do two things. See, as you can tell, when you order the, and receive the key, the replacement key from Levin, you'll see it's really long. So, so what we have to do is we have to cut it, grind it uh, to the required length. See the difference? And what we want is, so we're gonna press the key obviously from the inside. And what we want is we want about I'd say about a half a thousandth to one thousandth uh, uh, step right there. Step down, so down. there's no interference with the bearing installation. That's yes. correct. So and um and, and you'll see if you happen to disassemble eleven spindle and it already has a key, you will see that little step. So it's a little step down. Okay. So that's what Levin does. So we're gonna you know obviously follow the same uh, method they use. Okay, the other thing I like to do in addition to that is when you get a new key, a lot of times, like here, if I put it under a microscope, you're gonna see a lot of burrs. Okay, and sometimes even the top will be rough. This one's actually pretty smooth, but I've gotten them where, you know, you can see the machining marks. A little from chattery. The, from the end mill, yeah. exactly. And so what I always like to do is, I like, I get one of our little diamond uh, bent stones. Um, I use an extra fine. Remember, I, I don't want to remove a lot of material. I just want to make it smooth and remove the burrs. And you maintain know. very flat surface on the top. Yeah. No any tapers. Exactly. No corners. So yeah. if, I, if I wasn't using a diamond bent stone, uh, I wouldn't use anything more than, let's see, I think a red, yeah, a red India stone. A, I would say they call it a fine stone. That's a 400 grit. Okay, I'd be a little cautious using that. I think that's a little on the rough side. I'd really prefer maybe an Arkansas stone. You know, in any flavor, translucent, you know, soft, hard, any of those are pretty uh, fine. 
but yeah, but definitely be careful because you can see we don't have much material to work with. You know, you can really get just carried. want to touch, clean it up. That's and right. Just pay attention to that little detail right here. It's going to pay off down the road. Exactly, and you know, and, and more more important, you know, you want to get the sides too, just like this. See, let me just make sure I get that. So you know, you want to just get the sides real. You know, make sure the sides are cleaned up. You just want to clean the sides because it's these sides. Now, let me go grab a collet real quick. Okay, so this is a 3C collet. See, so this is going to slide in, you know, right in this keyway just like that. See, so that's why uh, we want the top smooth and we want the side smooth. So that way, when you insert the collet, we want the collet to go inside the spindle very smoothly. Okay, so just those two things. Okay, so what we're going to do, um, this is how I uh, trim the key. I first, uh, oh yeah, I should probably explain this. Okay, these aren't glass hard. Uh, they're hard, but not glass hard. That means you don't want to hold them you know, hold this in pliers because the serrated jaws will damage the sides. Okay, so be very careful. So what we use is this little hand vise with aluminum jaws. And um, you can get these guys, a lot of little online play hobby oh. places and all that carry these. See, nice time like that. See, and real good. And see, and that's how I'm going to do all my work on it. So, and that won't damage it. Okay, there's also other type of pliers. Like, these are pretty safe. These are old school pliers used in watchmaking. And these you can use as well without damaging. These are uh, made to hold watch parts. So, um, it, it won't damage the part. So, just like that. I just want to show you a couple of examples. You know, just be really careful uh, how you hold it to not damage it. Okay. okay, so what I'm going to do now is, now with this secured in my little hand vise, I'm going to take our Proxen rotary tool, and first I'm going to uh, use a little cutoff disc. So I'm going to, you know, cut off, the, you know, leave a little material for afterwards, I want to basically see if, if, if I show you the uh, existing one. See, I have quite a bit of material. So I don't want to grind the entire portion I need to remove. You don't want to generate that much heat. Yeah, I don't want to generate that much heat too. Good. Right, so so I'm going to take the majority of the material off with a cutoff disc. And then after I'm done with that, then I'm going to take it to our bench grinder. Maybe we'll show that really quickly a too. Snapshot there a little snapshot there. Yeah, Maybe okay. I'll take a couple of snapshots where we use a cutoff tool and a snapshot of, of taking it to our bench grinder and I can maybe um, offer a couple of suggestions there too. So, and that's that. Um, oh yeah, measuring. Let me, let me tell you how I measure. Okay, obviously if you have the old key, you can take your measurements off the old key. So that's what I did. And then I was able to scribe where I need to cut off. Okay, this is how we measure the wall thickness of the spindle. And we remember, we do this if you disassemble the spindle and there was no key at all. So we need to take measurements so you know how much material to take off on, on a new key. Because this is the old key. Yeah, so without was, measuring an old one, how thick is that? That's right. See, if I didn't have the old one to measure off of, how am I going to determine how much material to take off of the new key? So what we do is we're going to measure the wall thickness of the spindle and we're going to show you how we do it. So what we do is, oh let me show them, that, okay this happens to be just uh, a bar of O1 steel. We like to use this just because it's hard and it has a really nice smooth you know surface. But you can use anything, you can mm -hmm. use brass, aluminum. As this long is as perfectly it's, fine for this, for this uh... Yeah, for this application, we prefer. There's no burrs. There's no. Yeah, no lips, burrs. Nothing. It's smooth. It's close enough. Yeah. Yeah. Carefully insert it through the uh, fine spindle because it's really done well inside. Yeah. Okay. okay. And as you notice, this is going to take two people. That's why Lance is helping me. 
So Lance is going to hold. Oh, why don't you explain what you're doing? I'm holding this like this. I'm pushing down where the spindle actually sits. See, and and uh, that way, when he measures with the caliper, it's not going to push down on the on the uh, shaft coming through the uh, spindle. That's right. ID. Okay, so I'm just going to take a caliper, just a regular general caliper. Make sure I zero it. Okay, zero already. Okay. So I'm going to take use a take a depth reading. Oh, that's pretty good. Four point two six. Uh, yeah, because we measured the uh, when we measured the uh, the old key. We actually measured um, four point two four. What Levin chose is they chose to. Uh, take uh, 0.02 uh, off from the full. Oh, to thickness. establish that step. Yeah, to that step. Yeah. So okay. it stays unobstructed. And and this is precision. You know, that's why we're just using a caliper. You know, we don't have to, this isn't precision. All we want is when we push, you know, when we install the key from the bottom up, you know, we can't have any. Uh, you can't any, grind it if you've got it too long. That's you gotta right. Take it back out. You don't want no obstruction. So if you fit your key, you know, and you can, if it's you know protruding yeah. off from the outside the surface, you're gonna have to just. Fortunately, it's all press fit, so you just you know just knock it out with a punch, and then you're gonna have to take it to the grinder or your stone and just take off a little material and then just reinstall yeah, so it. So try to get it right. Yeah, but but basically what you're looking for, you're just looking for a, a, just a little step down. And that's what Levin does. They just they make the length where it just steps down just slightly. It's so little you have to see it under a loop. So it's, yeah. it's just fine out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how we do it. It's pretty simple. So we're gonna go out to the machine shop and we're gonna go ahead and uh, we're gonna go to the rotary tool first and do a cutoff operation. So Great. let's go. Okay, we're out in the machine shop and I've got the little collet key and we're first gonna use this little rotary tool from Proxen, and I just have just your common cut off disc, nothing special. And what I'm gonna do first is I'm just gonna make the first cut. So I'm not, this isn't the final dimension, it's just close to the dimension, because after I make this cut, then we're gonna go to the grinding wheel and then do the, and then grind it to the final dimension we want. So let's get started. We've cranked up that RPM there. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll be back. Okay, that didn't take too long. That was actually pretty quick. Um, okay, as you can see, there's a little piece we cut off. And so now we just have a little stub that we can work with, which is a lot better. All right, that's a okay. good shot of that right there. Okay, yeah, so we're done here. So let me wrap this up and we'll meet you out. Uh, the bench grinder. Great. Okay. Okay, we are back in the uh, over the grinding area with Patrick. There's Patrick. Okay. And we're gonna do our last stage, huh? So yes. Brian? Uh, close to the last stage. Okay. What we're gonna do is, hey, you know, we we did the cutoff operation. Okay. Now we're at the bench grinder. I just want to make a couple of notes. Okay. Uh, first off. I'm, I wouldn't be using the Benz grinder if it wasn't for having a really fine wheel. I believe there's a 220 grit wheel, super fine, because you know generally you you have like a 40 or 60 or an 80, so very important. So, and I'm I'm going to take this very close to final dimension, and then third, last thing I'm going to take it to the back to the workshop. And then with a file, I'm gonna do the very final final because what I also wanna do is I wanna kind of give it a little round, like a you know, like a little uh a little radius. Dome. Okay. Yeah, so just a slight radius. That's what Levin does too. Uh, that follows a profile of the spindle. So so here I'm just gonna get close to it. So let's get started. 
Oh, before anybody says anything, yes, we're using the surface plate as a little table. Okay, we normally don't do that. <laughs> so before somebody scolds me, or Lance scolds me. Oh, and we have a cup of water because, remember, we don't want to get this too hot because we don't want to, if it's um, uh, heat treated, you know, we don't want to ruin the heat treatment on it. No. So... Take a quick measurement. Okay, we're at four four three. Okay, yeah. See, we want about four point two four, so we're actually very close. So I think we're going to stop there. That actually went really quick. So I think we're going to stop there and uh, take it to the workshop. Great. Okay, we're here at my watchmaker bench. And I've got the key clamped into my little vise. And I made sure that I clamped it to where the key is perfectly level and straight. Because what I'm going to do is, you know, I'm going to file the top right here just like this. So I'm going to be level with the file. So I want to be sure everything's, you know, symmetrical and flat. Okay. So I'm going to do that. And then once I get to the final length, then I'm going to add that little radius. I was talking about. Oh, to kind of follow the contour of the spindle. The spindle. The OD. Right. And this has to be really slight. You can, you'll barely see the radius, just enough. And then, and then now, and then I'll complete this stage. So when I'm done with this, we'll actually meet you back at the table, and then we're gonna use the diamond stone, and then we're gonna, you know, deburr it and all that, and then we can go ahead and try um, fit it into the spindle and see how we did. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay, we are back after final filing, I guess, right? And yeah. And you're gonna share a little more before we install it. Actually, off camera, it, I completed it. Ah. So I just wanna share with everybody the final stage because it's really simple. So I just went ahead and just did it off camera. So let's go ahead and I'll show you. Okay, over at the watchmaker's bench, I took it down to final length. And then I also rat did my little radius. So all that's completed. So after I was done with that, I came back here to the, to the table. And what I did was I wanted to focus on the last step. And that's to uh, just uh, really lightly, I just wanted to uh, grind the sides, the top, you know, just to make sure it's smooth, uh, no burrs. And I don't like sharp edges as well. So we just wanted to, you know, just break the edges. So how I did that, is I use our little collet vise. And these are really nice, you know, they just take your regular watchmaker collets. So you, you select the size you need and it's perfect. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't damage the part you're working on. So that's why we like to use these. And the goal here is to get the most amount of life out of this uh, little key we can, right? It's to, it's to get it to last as long as we can. That, that too, right. So that's why all the effort's being put in it. Exactly. Yeah, we want it perfect as much as possible. Sure. Okay. Okay, so the first thing I do is, I let me see if I can get this on a camera as best I can. So what I did first was, I did the sides first. So really carefully, you know, I just, uh, let's see, so I can give you two views. Okay, so. Yeah, just like that. So I just took it to the side like that. And then what I did was just very lightly, I just went back and forth. And then I just repeated the other side. You know, and using your loop, you know, you want to uh, use a loop to make sure, you know, you're doing, you know, you aren't damaging anything and you're making sure, you know, uh, you're getting a flat surface. Okay, so once I'm done with the sides, the next thing I do is I want to make sure the top is nice and smooth and flat and so forth. So basically, really careful. You know, I just set it like this, trying to just get a nice a little smooth. light, gentle motion. No, no forces. No, no. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you don't want to remove material. Remember, we just we're just trying to break any sharpness, some machining, 
uh, what they call it, the cutter mark, yeah, you know, right. like the end mill marks and all that. You know, we, we're just, we just want to make it smooth so that the collet inserts really nice and smooth when you're using it. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So we're just ensuring it's flat. So like Lance said, just really light pressure. And that's why we really don't want to use an India stone for this. Really, if, if you don't have a di uh, diamond stone like this, like I'm using an extra fine, I really recommend uh, an Arkansas stone. Yeah, I think, that's, I, I really think, think yeah, I think I really think using that red India stone, even though it's 400 grit. It might be a little aggressive. Yeah, a little too aggressive. So, okay. So once I'm done with that, you know, I now have my two sides done, my top done. And then very lightly, I mean really light, I take, let's see if I can do this. Uh, so what I do is I take the corner at 45 degrees, just like this, see? And then just really lightly, I just go, you know, do just one stroke, even stroke, turn it around again, another even stroke, you know, look at it with my loop. And if everything looks good and even, uh, we're done. It really enhances the collet's ability to just glide right over that key. You're absolutely right because, you know, I've seen it where there's, you know, you'll see uh, a spindle with a key that has all these burrs and, you know, and it, yeah, it just doesn't make the collet go in smoothly. That's right. Yeah. And I think it'll last. Overall, it'll give it a, a longer life. So let me take it out. Okay, so I think um, this is done. Uh, this is ready to be installed. So you ready, Lance? Yeah, let's start. I guess this is the official start of the spindle rebuild because... That's right. This is... We're going to put this, something on instead of fixing it or that's, taking it off. Or, that's right. We're actually a fish, almost officially done with part three. And then now we can go into the part three sub parts and start doing the assembly of the spindles. We waited for this. That's yeah. exciting. Let's do it. Okay, so let's go get this installed. Let's switch views. Okay. Okay, we're ready to install the key. Okay, uh, again, you're going to need two people for this. You know, uh, Lance is going to be holding the spindle for me, and then I'm going to be doing the tapping to tap it, tap the key into the spindle. Okay, some of the, th the tools you're going to need is, okay, be sure you have your spindle and your key. Okay, that bar you saw us use earlier, you're gonna need a bar like this. Okay, because we're gonna use this to assist us in you know, getting that key pushed in. Okay, and we'll show that to you. Okay, and the other thing we highly recommend is a small dead blow hammer. Really small. Yeah, really small. And again, has those nice soft faces. It's a very light uh, press. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a tight. Yeah, it's fit. not a tight uh, press fit. All it is is going to hold her in place real securely, but nothing out of that or nothing, nothing off the charts here. So that's right. If you if anything gets too aggressive, it's likely you don't have something quite right. Good point. Okay. Sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, and you know, especially soft faces, we don't want to damage the spindle and and a dead blow because we don't want that rebound. You're going to need that nice dead blow push. Okay. Okay, so with that said, uh, let's get started. Oh, and I recommend having a loop. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so what I'm going to do is, you're going to need tweezers. So what I do is, so I hold on, hold on to the key by the end with the tweezers. And I put in a little angle, you know, so I can push in the hole to start. Okay, then what I do is, so to gauge the depth, you know, I first see how deep I have to go, go, and then I use my finger right here to gauge it. So that way, when I go inside, I kind of have a good idea how far I need to go. Okay, so this is where you're going to need your loop. So... You okay. should get a good start. Yeah. See, I see it already really quick. See, with my loop, I'm just looking. Okay, yeah, it's in there pretty good. Okay, perfect. It's in there. Okay, this is where... Okay, you don't want to push in too far now. Just a little bit to where it's just snug in there where it won't fall out. Because now you want to be sure the alignment's perfect. Yeah. Right. Okay, so that's what I'm going to check for now. Yeah, because you wouldn't believe how many of these keys are installed crooked. I mean, it's so common, and I really hate that. Okay, it's a little crooked, so let me fix it. Yeah, 
He's making that adjustment with the gravity uh, of the of the uh, key downward, so it doesn't when he adjusts it doesn't fall out or something. Oh, that's a good point. Right. So, you know, so he's rotated it around after he installed it. Okay, that looks good. Should I get a closer view just so they can see it real yeah. quick? Yeah, yeah let me change views just so you can see it. See, just to give you an idea how far. It's, I just inserted it into the hole just enough to where it won't fall out. And see, this is where we can make our adjustments. So as you can see, it's perfectly aligned. Nice. Okay, so now that it's aligned, what I'm going to do is you could use anything. I like to use a pen like this. Now we just want to push it down more. And I'll explain why. So let me just. It should go down a little bit more. Okay, there we go. Heard that. Sounded good. Yeah, it sounded good. Let me make sure it's still nuts. Let me fix the alignment. Yeah, just take your time. Yeah, a little adjustment. Put it down a little more, a little adjustment until that's what it's going to be, right? That's right. We'll have a final little uh, tap pressing going on here. Okay, perfect. Right. Okay, um, oh, here, let me show it to you again. Okay, see how it's right there? It's gone in lower now. It's lower now. Oops, let me bring it up a little bit. Just like that. Okay, so I had to push it in a little further too, is because I need enough room to get the bar to come through, which we're going to show you next. Okay, so, okay, what I do is, um, with the keyhole facing up. Okay, now very carefully, I'm gonna insert our bar right in. Yeah, it's not gonna fall out anymore. It's already no, enough. That's, that's why in. we don't have to rely on gravity anymore. We need to get some real work done. That's right, okay, here, let me give it to you carefully. Oops. Okay, I'm going to. That yeah, kind of show how you're holding it. Okay. Over here. See, he's using. I'm gonna bring it up heavier with my strongest finger, my thumb there. I'm gonna bring up the back. I'm gonna bring up the back there like that. Yeah, bring up the back. And the front's just floating because, see it? Because he's riding on the key. You're right, so I'm gonna be pounding on the key, so I don't want him to hold on to it really. All he's gonna do is just keep it in alignment centered. Yeah, just That's keep it. Yeah, okay, just like that. Like that? Yeah. And the back's pressured up, so it's almost like in a level position. Right, because see, it's gonna go like this. So, see the back, you wanna lift up. Yeah, because then the front's going to lift up when I hammer. Okay, so let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. I got a good okay. good hold on it. And I can see it's not that much pressure. It's not It's not hard to do. Just be, it's going nice. I think, I see, that's all it, it takes. Maybe it. I think that's it. Take the shaft out. Oh, yeah, I mean, very carefully. Yeah, no, no gouging here. We just spent a time on there. Oh, here, let me take a, um, oh, no, I'll, does it look, mm. oh, it looks great, perfect, here, I'll do a, I'll do a quick view for you guys, let's see how it looks, see, it's, yeah, that's what you're looking for, perfect, see, it's all lined and fully inserted, and see, Perfect. See, if you can see, uh, let's see if I can give you a good shot here. Um, see, if you notice, see, it just steps in just slightly. Let's see if I can get a better view. Oh, yeah. Go side to side. Definitely no obstruction when we go to install the bearings, for sure. It looks nice and clean. Yeah. So, good. So, this spindle is ready to be installed. Uh, let's see. Um, you want to try a collet? Oh, good point. Uh, let's yeah, let's try a collet. Let's make sure. Let's see how precise we've gotten here. Cause that collet won't lie. That's a hardage. Nice. Perfect. How's that fit? Oh, oh, that's a nice fit. I can see it already. I don't hear it. it. I'm not hearing the rattle like we're used That's to right. with older ones. Yeah, it's <laughs> no rattle. 
But oh. there, there's, but I can move it slightly, which you need. You, you need you, a little give, yeah. Yeah, you want a little give. Oh, but that's beautiful. That's a nice fit right there. Oh yeah. Oh, it comes right out. See, no drag on it. Beautiful. Yeah, see? Really easy. Oh my. And it comes out. That's what you're looking for. Okay, so uh, that's all there is to it to replace a collet key. And obviously buying the key from Levin helps a lot, so we don't have to make it from scratch. Oh, yeah. But, um, oh, I do want to um, mention, okay, you know, when I took the length down on a collet key, you know, I first used a, I used a cutoff wheel, I took it to the bench grinder, and then I took it to the watchmaker bench, and then did the manual filing. Okay, I did all those three. I just wanted to show you guys a variety of ways to take the length down. Yeah. Okay, that doesn't mean you have to do it that way. You know, I was thinking about it. You know, uh, you can go, if you want, you can go directly to hand filing if you want. It's, this is just how we've always done it, though, because that right. way we don't have to order another key. <laughs> right. And that, it's, it's a little just, bit of a cautionary way we work our way down to it. Yeah, and so for us, it's, it's, it's just a quick way of doing it. You know, remove most of the material with the cutoff wheel. You know, then then use a bench grinder. We do that to keep the heat down. That right. that's so true. We're afraid to get it too hot, and then yeah. I don't know what's happening. So yeah. yeah, that's true. And we are actually lucky. You know, we're usually I'm usually at the bench uh, the bench grinder for a longer time. Yeah. I just happened to have, you know, hit that uh, perfect length where I was comfortable with really quick. He got the cut off pretty accurate. Yeah, I got the cut off. That's not usually. Yeah, that's not usually. Crooked. The thing. It's, like, it's a so, little close on one end and not so close on the other side. Right. Yeah, you know. So I lucked out for the video. Yes. <laughs> and then um, so yeah, it went perfect. So I hope that helps you guys out. So um, I think that uh, wraps up part three. Wraps up part three, and that's the first part of the assembly. Yeah. So um, now we're gonna go into the sub parts, and I think uh, we're actually gonna build the uh, accessory spindle first. We've been using that one all the way along so far. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good one. So we're going to do that little spindle first. And, and then work our way up. And work our way up. Maybe the open style headstock yeah. and the D call it closed headstock. And then lastly, we'll go to the 3C closed style headstock. Perfect. So great. All right. As watchmakers and micro machinists, Patrick and I thank you for following along with us while we take this journey. We look forward to bringing you another exciting show shortly.